You've written an impressive number of articles on the relation between early childhood education and economics. Could you tell us a bit about your approach to these topics? Well, my general interest in ed education is that it affects the future skills of the population. And in this, it's clear, as Jim Heckman and others have said, that the better you start, the better you end up, and that this is a cumulative process so that early childhood education um, is one of the building blocks. Now, it may come from the family or it may come from organized uh, providers of early childhood education, but the result is that people who come better prepared to school learn more and end up better prepared to go into the labor market and into the future. So it's all uh, much uh, the same as others, that it's an investment notion, but that early investments build and mount up more rapidly if they're successful. In a recent report from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the U.S. ranked in the middle of the pack in performance on the Program for International Student Assessment, or PISA. Given that the U.S. invests more per child than most high-ranking countries, this seems to suggest that further government investment in education does not guarantee student performance. Is this correct? And if so, is there a more efficient way for the U.S. to structure its spending on education to maximize student performance? Well, I think it's correct both for the U.S. and other governments that just putting more money into the system very seldom leads to better achievement and better performance. What the uh, PISA results that you refer to uh, point out is that our schools are doing significantly worse than a large number of other country schools. And it bears little relationship to how much each country spends. It's much more important how money is spent than how much is spent. And that's what uh, we have to pay attention to in the U.S. Now, efficient outcomes to me mean uh, getting better teachers. Uh, the one thing that we've learned from all of our studies in the schools is that the quality of the teacher is the most dominant part of the formal schooling. Uh, we talked about early childhood before, uh, before people get to school, but once they get to formal schooling, the quality of the teacher is what counts. Currently, our pay for teachers is unrelated, uncorrelated with performance of the teachers. So that we pay a large number, a large amount to some teachers who aren't very good, and we pay a small amount to others that are very good. One of the problems with this is that we don't keep the right teachers, so we don't encourage the really good teachers to stay longer than the really bad teachers, um, and we don't have any policies to get rid of bad teachers. So it's hard to imagine an efficient running of our schools without paying for the inputs and the, without the money going toward high quality inputs. We spend two thirds of our funds on schools on teachers and personnel, and yet we, when, that, when we have more money or extra money, we don't ensure that that money goes to hiring better personnel. We just pay more. And so in that situation, it's hard to imagine an efficient allocation. Now, it's also hard to just say we need better teachers. Uh, you have to think about institutional structures that might encourage that. Uh, for me, that would include a good accountability system for what the schools are doing, broad choice of schools by parents, allowing them to decide where they go, pay for performance uh, for the people in the schools, and a lot of local decision making, because it's hard to make decisions from far away from a school that are going to be very effective. You can't go to the state capital and declare what every school in the country should do or in the state um, without knowing what is the capacity of the local school or what are the demands are. In your very recent book with Paul E. Peterson and Ludger Vosman, you argue that the U.S. school system has dramatically failed its students and its citizens when compared with school systems in other nations. 
What are some of the most significant ways the U.S. system fails where others succeed? Well, the simplest way, uh, this is a book called Endangering Prosperity, that is written to try to convince people that it's worth doing a lot to improve our schools. The way that the U.S. schools fail is that they don't provide high levels of skills for all of the people of the U.S. What we know from looking at economic growth is that the only thing that matters in the long run is the skills of the people. Almost everything else just falls to the wayside when we look at long-run uh, policies. Now, we spend a lot of time and we should think about the short run and so forth, but uh, when we have a recession like the 2008 recession, all of the attention was only on the very shortest of run situations, and there was no balance with considering the fact that in the long run, 2008 is going to look like a little blip and it's the growth that we get that's really important. So the book with uh, Paul Peterson and Luther Woosman tries to show what would happen if we improved our performance of our students. And according to history, uh, the, the numbers are just ast astounding when you look at them, according to history, if we could be at the level of Canada, which looks rather feasible if you think of Canada as being very close to the U.S., we could have achievement at the level of Canada. Uh, historical impacts on growth suggest that in present value terms over the next 80 years, every every or the average worker's paycheck could be 20% higher. That is, each and every year for 80 years, the average worker could earn 20% more due to the added growth that you would get if we had a higher skill level up to Canada. Now this all seems feasible, uh, but we're not paying attention to that. Um, if you compare that to the total cost of the 2008 recession on the U.S. economy, you find that it's worth about 10 times as much as the um, total cost of the recession to improve our schools. How could we change the structure of the U.S. school system in order to remedy these failures? Well, the biggest thing, uh, it's easy for an economist to say, the biggest thing would be to align the incentives with what we hope to achieve. Right now, what we see is that the incentives for people working in schools are uh, only loosely related to performance of students. And so what you would like to do is to get everybody working toward improving the achievement of students as opposed to ensuring the uh, wages and benefits of the adults in the school. So this, uh, to me, comes back to the, what I mentioned before. The things that we know that work from international evidence uh, include better accountability systems, more choice of schools, more local autonomy, pay for performance, and of course, as we talked about, also getting kids prepared for school better in early childhood and, and other uh, other additions uh, or complements to what the family does. Would it be sufficient that the U.S. improve its educational performance, or must it also improve its ranking on a global stage? Well, I don't think we have to improve our ranking per se. It's the skills that are important. Uh, in my view, everybody can, can, in fact, grow faster and do better. And it's not that we um, pull ahead of the Germans or the Canadians or the Singaporeans. Um, it's more that we increase the quality of our skills. Now, the rankings will, uh, by standard international trade ideas, imply what kinds of jobs we do and what our role is relative to other countries. Um, and there are certain advantages, obviously, to being at the top of the rankings economically. We see that in terms of our ability to run a foreign policy that we like and a defense policy and other things that are related to our economic stature in the world. If everybody else Grows, grows rapidly and surpassed us, which is not going to happen soon, but if they surpassed us, that would 
dramatically affect our ability to influence the rest of the world. In a recent paper, you argue that individuals who received vocational training rather than a general education experience diminished employment later in life, given the current and continuing rapid changes in technology. This might seem surprising to many, as vocational training is typically viewed as a more secure means to future employment. Could you speak on the differences between vocational and general education that explain this surprising result? For most analyses and most thinking about vocational education concentrates almost entirely on the school-to-work transition and looks at what happens when kids leave school and become adult workers. The argument has been, although the evidence is a little mixed, but the argument has been that vocational training by providing immediately usable skills to individuals makes it easier for youth to find uh, jobs quickly. What we concentrate in recent paper on vocational education is the skills over the entire life cycle. If you train somebody to do very specific things, and if the economy progresses, grows, technologies change, productivity increases, some of these vocational workers will be left behind because their skills aren't in demand anymore. So what we see is that um, if you look at the countries in Europe with the largest vocational sectors, um, Germany, Switzerland, and Denmark were countries that we looked at that have intense uh, firm-based education programs and apprenticeship programs. These uh, countries show that employment rates of people with vocational education start going down in the late 40s and early 50s of age and go down much more rapidly than the employment for those with general skills. Our interpretation is very simply that what general education does is provide people with the ability to adapt and learn new things and to change. This is the old Ted Schultz argument that in fact education provides the ability to deal with new circumstances with disequilibrium. Um, and that's what we see in the data. Um, so that uh, for people with very good vocational skills, um, we might go away. In the same paper, you suggest that this does not imply that vocational training should be replaced with general training but rather only that policymakers should take these results into account when revising educational policy. Is this to say that vocational training could be modified to curb this trend, or rather that vocational training should be more carefully implemented within an educational system? Well, I think it means several things, and we're just suggesting alternative ways to deal with what we think are, is a fact, that the later life employment of people with vocational education is in jeopardy. Um, vocational training in, in most countries, in Germany, is a mixture of general skills and very specific skills. So people are apprentice, uh, apprentices in uh, bakeries and in sports uh, medicine and in accountancy. Um, but there's a mixture there that they get in Germany uh, a lot of classroom instruction to in basic skills. So first, whenever you talk about more vocational training, you shouldn't think about that as an alternative to providing basic skills that are going to carry people along when they get in general education. Uh, secondly, uh, one of the reasons that it appears that general education has this payoff later in life is that the people who get general education in these countries tend to also get more training throughout their lifetime. So that their uh, new training and new courses uh, are larger, more numerous and, and more intensive than any of the vocational people in general. And that this might be one of the reasons why they can in fact maintain employment later in life. You could think of trying to find institutions to provide incentives for both individuals and firms to provide continuous uh, learning and training for people with vocational education. Now that runs into the problems that we've 
it's in the U.S., and that is that it's really hard to teach new skills to old people. Uh, I've said, said as an old person here that uh, it's hard to learn new, new things over time, and so necessarily the education and training that people get later in life is going to be more difficult. Uh, so it's a continual struggle to keep individuals ready to work in uh, an economy that's changing at all times. Hasn't the U.S. been doing a large number of things to reform its schools and spending a large amount of money to improve its performance? Well, actually, for the last three or four decades, there have been public calls to improve our schools. It probably started when the Soviets launched the first uh, satellite Sputnik, and the U.S. was concerned that it wasn't keeping up with Soviet science. In 1983, there was a major study called A Nation at Risk that said that our country was in danger because of the quality of our schools. And it's continued since then. Um, President George H.W. Bush uh, called a conference of 49 of the governors in Virginia to talk about education. And they came out with a policy in 1989 that we should be first in the world in math and science by the year 2000. Well, we're far beyond 2000, and as we've discussed, the U.S. is maybe 32nd in the world in math achievement, so we haven't made it. Every president since then, uh, President Clinton, President George W. Bush, and President Obama have called for improving our schools. What's happened along the way is that we've dramatically increased what we spend on schools. We've quadrupled spending per pupil in real terms after we adjust for inflation since 1960. But we've also tracked the achievement of our students. And if you look at the math or reading abilities of our 17-year-olds just before they leave secondary school, we find that it's been flat over this entire period. So we've dramatically increased spending without getting any return. And what we've done is uh, try to keep the old system, just make it bigger. So we uh, have smaller classes, we have higher paid teachers, uh, but none of these are related to effectiveness very closely. There's lots of research to suggest that any impact of class size is small and it just pales compared to the impact of you know, highly, highly effective teachers. But we also, as we discussed, pay salaries that are unrelated to effectiveness. So we put a lot of money into the system and got nothing for it. That's why we have to really consider more deeply what kinds of institutions and what kinds of changes that we would like to make.